Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Cynthia Rudden. Um, she's a professor of computer science at Duke University. Uh, welcome, doctor, and stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so my talk is, is called Stop Explaining Black Box Machine Learning Models for High Stakes Decisions and Use Interpretable Models Instead. So let me uh, first give you some definitions. So what, what is a black box? Um, well, a black box predictive model is a formula that's either too complicated to understand or it's proprietary, which means it's somebody's secret sauce and its computations are hidden. Um, they're hidden and you don't know what it is. Okay, so what happens um, when you use a back? black box. Well, there's a lot of bad things that, that could happen, and, and let me give you some examples. So the first thing is that you could get several extra years of prison time. Um, so this is the, uh, an example that was in the New York Times. It's uh, the story of Glenn Rodriguez, who was um, uh, sent to prison at a young age for a crime he committed as a kid, and he was denied parole 17 years later, or, or you know, whatever it was. And, and why was that? And it was because someone had incorrectly entered some information into a black box predictive model that was being used to predict whether he would commit a crime in the future. And at the parole board hearing, um, you know, his parole was denied and there was nothing he could do about it. And then after the hearing, he compared his score sheet to someone else's and noticed an error in his criminal history features. And this model, the, the compass model that was used for making this decision had it had up, up to 137 factors in it, so it wasn't easy to spot an error in its proprietary model. Now, um, this same situation probably happens to a lot of people with this same model because it's widely used across the criminal justice system. And if the model was interpretable, it would have been much easier to spot the error. Okay, and you know, this is not how the criminal justice system is supposed to work, right? It's not supposed to, typographical errors are not supposed to determine people's prison sentences. Okay, so what else could happen to you as a result of a black box model? Well, if you lived in California during the wildfires in 2018, you might have been using Google's daily air quality predictions to determine whether it was safe to go outside. You might have seen Google's predictions, you know, that air quality was fine um, on days when people were also seeing a layer of ash on their cars. <laughs> because during the wildfires, Google replaced the EPA's trustworthy air quality index with a proprietary machine learning model from the company Breezometer, which claimed to be more accurate. But clearly this proprietary model was not doing what it was supposed to, and it put a lot of people in danger. I don't know how many kids went playing outside on those days, but hopefully the layer of ash on the cars would have, would have deterred them, but, but who knows. Okay, another thing that could happen to you is you could receive worse healthcare because of your race. And this article said that a hospital was ranking patients to get additional attention and the white people got higher rankings, even if they were not as sick. And it was because the algorithms were using cost information to predict who should be given care, and the black patients were receiving lower cost health care. And so the algorithm thought they were less sick, and then it didn't recommend additional, the additional care for them. Okay, now I've just given you a few things that have gone wrong with using black box models, but there's a tremendous amount more that could go wrong, and probably many things have gone wrong that were hidden, so I don't know about them. Um, but now people are starting to use machine learning for like medical decision making, for loan decisions and self-driving cars, and for all manner of other things that you really, really don't want to go wrong. And some people love their black boxes, right? They, they argue fiercely that they need them. Anyway, what's an interpretable model? So an interpretable machine learning model obeys a domain-specific set of constraints that makes its computations easier to understand. Okay, so I have a more technical definition, but essentially it's just a model that's constrained so that it makes more sense, okay? And uh, um, you, can, you can have a model that is, um, so there's a, this is actually a spectrum between models that are sort of very heavily constrained so that they're very sparse and um, you, want, you can understand exactly how all the variables work together to form the final prediction. And then on the other extreme, there are models that are just loosely constrained like the model is just forced to be monotonically increasing along one variable, for instance. Okay, so I want to give you an example on the extreme end of interpretability, just to show you, you know, where it's where the model is very, very interpretable, and you can use it for high stakes decisions. Okay, so the example I'm going to give is um, seizure predictions in critically ill uh, 
patients. So these are patients who have um, who are at risk for for brain seizures. Okay, so let's say that you come into the hospital with an you have an aneurysm here. This is an aneurysm, and it bursts, and you have a hemorrhage, and there's blood in your brain. And then what would happen to you is that you would get surgery, and then you'd be in the intensive care unit being monitored with continuous EEG monitors. Okay, now for patients like this, seizures are common. About 20% of the patients get seizures. The seizures are very dangerous. They lead to brain damage, they lead to death, and um, you, you need, uh, they, they can actually be, the seizures can actually be worse than the original injury, and you need continuous EEG to detect seizures. EEG is the, is the only way to detect seizures and to predict seizures because these are seizures that happen only in your brain. It's not like it's not like the patient is shaking or anything like that. So um, we have they have these monitors, but the pro there's there's um, there's problems with the monitors because you know even though we need them to detect uh, seizures, the monitors there's a limited number of monitors and there's a limited number of staff to monitor the monitors, and so um, we need to allocate them carefully. And often the monitors stay too long on people who don't need them and then they don't get to people who actually need them. So we need to better allocate the monitors too. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is a model that we developed with neurologists. It's called the Two Helps Two Score. It's a machine learning model and um, it predicts seizure risk within six hours, okay? So here's the model. I'm gonna put the whole thing on the slide. Okay, so here's the model, and you get points for various uh, various aspects of your EEG measure, you know, various things that the, the neurologist can read within your EEG um, signal, and then you get, you get those points, and then the total score translates into a risk using this table down here. Okay, and it's called two helps to be because it's two H-E-L-P-S and then two points for the V. So the doctors can memorize the model just by knowing its name. All right. So um, the two helps to B score, as I mentioned, it was not created by doctors. It was cre created by data fed into a machine learning algorithm. It's a full-blown machine learning model. It's not just a rule of thumb that someone made up. However, it is also just as accurate as any black box model you could use on this same data set. And it doesn't force you to trust it like a black box does, right? The doctors can look at this model and they can decide them themselves whether or not they want to trust it. Also, doctors can calibrate the score with information not in the database. So if the doctor looks at the patient and says, oh, this patient needs an extra point because uh, they're more vulnerable because of this other thing, then the doctors can use their clinical judgment and combine that with, these, with um, statistics and data to help them make a better decision for the patient. All right, now I showed you that the two helps to B score was only made of six variables, right? This is a sparse linear model with integer coefficients. But those six variables were chosen from a database of you know, over 70 um, variables. So this was actually a data-driven decision. Now, if you're curious about the mathematics that went into creating that risk score, um, creating the two helps to be, the two helps to be is actually a solution to the optimization problem that I have up on the screen. Uh, so the first term here, this is the logistic loss that helps keeps the model accurate and calibrate it to the data. And then this term over here says, please keep the model small, like have a, a, only a very small number of, of uh, non-zero terms in the model. And then in this constraint, the set of constraints over here says that the, the coefficients of this linear model should be small integers between negative 10 and 10. And so you saw that two helps to be had only integer, had only you know, ones and twos in it. And so those came from this constraint. Now, if you're an expert in optimization, you would know that this is actually a really hard optimization problem. This is a, a mixed integer nonlinear program and um, it's quite hard to solve, but that's why we need computer scientists, right? This, the problem is we shouldn't leave these problems, we shouldn't sort of voice these problems onto doctors um, we should we should we should solve these problems um, as computer scientists. Okay, so now when the patients come into the the hospital with their burst aneurysm, they get uh, monitored with the EEG monitors, and then the neurologists look and they say, "Oh, look, the two helps to B score is whatever it is," and then 
now I know what to do with the patient. So in this case, they would place the patient on continuous EEG for at least 72 hours and start them on preventative medications. Now, the 2 helps to b score so far um, has been validated on an independent multi-center cohort. So what I'm showing you in this plot is predicted versus um, true. Okay, so this is predicted versus true. So being on the diagonal is better. And the dark blue is the original study that we built the 2 helps to b score from. That's the original data. And then the green is the validation data. And what you can see is that um, it's nicely falling along the diagonal um, uh, in the validation set, which is where we want it to be. And then um, the 2 helps to b score has actually been implemented at several different hospitals. And, and um, so far has resulted in a 63.6% .6 reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient. And what that means is that the doctors can monitor quite a few more patients, um, which really helps them um, prevent brain damage and save lives. And it's, it's saved a bit of, of uh, this is a, a conservative estimate of how much it saved in one year at these two hospitals. But the truth is that the really important number is the fact that they've been able to monitor a lot more patients than before because they have um, the two helps to be score. Okay, so that is how interpretable models are supposed to work. You should be able to use them in even very high stakes decision making settings. And, and um, you know, you, the doctor, it, it should agree with what the doctors might want to, um, might want to consider trusting, right? But the doctors don't have to trust it. But don't these kinds of models lose accuracy? I mean, I said that two helps to be score didn't lose accuracy, but a lot of people just don't believe me about that. So I'm gonna give another example. And that is, I'm gonna go back to the example of Glenn Rodriguez and talk about the compass score. So the compass score is a proprietary model. And we were wondering how accurate compass actually is. So, I mean, you know, there's a company that makes money off of the use of this, this um, model. So we figured, okay, let's evaluate it. And luckily, there was a dump of data from Florida where we actually got compass scores for, for, for individuals from Florida. So we could actually determine how accurate compass was in comparison to other machine learning methods. So at the time this data came out a couple of years ago, we took the compass scores from Florida and we compared the accuracy of compass to our latest machine learning method at the time, which is called CORALS or Certifiably Optimal Rule List. Now, Corals is just, it's just an optimal decision tree method. It produces optimal one-sided decision trees. And the model that Corals produced was actually incredibly sparse. It was, it was really small. And I'm gonna put it on the bottom of the slide here. And you know, we took a look at this model and we thought, you know, good grief, there's just no way we're gonna be able to compete with this, you know, with Compass, with this model right here. Okay, so what, what does the model say? So the model says, if you're young, if you're 19 to 20 years old and you're male, then predict a rest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you're 21 to, 20, 21 to 22 years old and you have two to three prior offenses, then predict a rest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if the number of prior offenses you have is more than three, predict a rest. Otherwise, no, predict no rest. So we thought there's no way that this can, this tiny little thing can compete with with Compass, but actually it did. Um, they were about equally accurate. And this is tenfold cross-validation. So the different colors here are the different folds of the data. And what's even more interesting perhaps is the fact that it doesn't matter which machine learning method you use, they all perform the same. So here I'm also looking at boosted decision trees and support vector machines with radial basis function kernels and random forests and so on and so forth. So some of these models are so big that you couldn't put them on a PowerPoint slide, you know, in, in contrast with the model that Corals produced, which is right there on the bottom of the screen. So um, hopefully you're, you're, you'll start to believe that actually we're not losing accuracy when we use interpretable models. And it's not always the case that you can get a model that's that sparse, right? But you, could, you can get models that are constrained that help make them more interpretable. Okay, so an interpretable machine learning model is when you use a model that is not a black box. And then I want to contrast that in this talk with explainable machine learning. 
So these terms get confused a lot, but I, I tend to use them fairly consistently. So interpretable machine learning is you have, you have a model that's not a black box. The model's inherently interpretable. And in explainable machine learning, that's when you use the black box and you try to explain what it's doing afterward. So that, that is like post hoc um, explainability, okay? So you might start with a black box and then you could create another model that approximates it. Or you could take that black box and compute derivatives of it or visualize what part of the, part of the input the model is paying attention to. Okay, so the problem is that people get these things really confused, but the truth is that there's really a chasm between these two concepts. Now, explanations of black box models, you can get into a lot of trouble when you, when you use those because you're essentially just making excuses for why you need a black box rather than why, you know, rather than just replacing that black box with something that's inherently interpretable. So let me go through some reasons why these explanations don't really work that well. So the first one is called double trouble. And this is where it, the, um, the combination of the, explain, the black box and its explanation model, that's two models, it's double trouble. So it forces you to rely on two models instead of one, the black box and the explanation. And those two models necessarily disagree with each other. Because if they don't, then you can just throw away the black box and just use the interpretable, you know, you can just use the explanation as an inherently interpretable model. So they must disagree with each other. And then the question is, well, how often do they disagree with each other? Because if you have an explanation that's right 90% of the time, well, you might think that's great, but the truth is that model is wrong 10% of the time. So 10% of the time you can't trust the explanation, which means you can't trust the black box. So not so great. Also, if you're using a black box, you still have this problem with typographical errors that I showed you with Compass. Even if you were to explain Compass or produce an approximation to it, you'd still have the problem that you're dealing with um, typographical errors or when you input data into it. And I think the most um, important argument is that if you can produce an accurate interpretable model, why should you explain a black box? So in other words, why are we still using Compass when we could use a much simpler model like the ones from Corals, although I don't advocate those models specifically for criminal justice. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more, more detail about this. So explanations are not actually explanations of what the model is doing. Um, so if people, you know, they say, well, we're producing an explanation for it, but actually they're producing an approximation. Approximations are not explanations. They get variable importance wrong. So here's a case where I'm a, I have a complicated black box and I'm approximating by a linear model. Uh, and the problem is that you could run into this situation where the black box could depend on say age and number of prior crimes, but the explanation could depend on age, priors, and race. And you might think then that the black box also depends on race when in fact it doesn't. It only depends on race through its correlations with age and prior crimes. And you might say like, this would never happen. Like who would do this kind of silly thing? But it actually might happen. And it actually did happen. So, um, and in particular, it happened with Compass. Okay, so somebody took Compass and approximated it and um, you know, claimed then that Compass depended on race. So I'm gonna show you the article that did that. This is the pro famous ProPublica article called Machine Bias. And they say their software used across the country to predict future criminals and it's biased against blacks. Now, um, you know, Compass is definitely unfair, but not in the way that ProPublica points out in this article. Like the science in this article is just plain wrong. So, um, let me, and this is exactly what they did. They approximated Compass with a linear model. And then they said the linear model depends on race other, in addition to age and number of priors and therefore so does Compass, but that, that's where they went wrong. Okay, so let me tell you what they did. They showed the false positive rate and false negative rate of Compass varies by race. And then they suggested this might not be a good comparison. We should condition on age and number of priors and re-examine. And this is a good idea, of course. And then after conditioning on age and number of priors, ProPublica still found a linear approximation to Compass with a low p-value for the race covariate. 
And then they concluded that compass depends on race, which of course um, the problem is that we don't think compass is the linear model. And so their conclusion is actually, is actually, you know, doesn't follow from their assumptions. Okay, so um, in any case, we luckily we had this data from Florida that, that ProPublica provided so we could actually check these things. And what I'm showing you here is a scatter plot of compass versus age. So each point here in this plot is a, um, is um, a, an individual, and this is their compass score. And you can see that this lower curve here is not, um, it's not linear. Not, it's not a linear function of age, it's very linear. And so we think this, is, this lower curve is the approximation of, of um, is, is the contribution of age to compass. Okay, so what we did then was we repeated ProPublica's analysis by taking um, compass minus that function of age and examining whether it depends on race and it doesn't seem to. So in other words, ProPublica's result seems to disappear once you take into account the correct, um, the correct calculation for age. Okay, so, and you can see then if you go back into ProPublica's article where they had, you know, these pairs of individuals um, where they were saying, okay, well, you know, um, this is a, a white person with a low compass score with a large criminal history and then the opposite for um, a black person, but the problem was that these people have very different ages, and the age could could explain what happened here. I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's what could have happened. Okay, so in any case, I think the real problem with Compass is that um, they have 100, you know, up to 137 factors entered by hand, and you know, one percent error rate leads to, uh, <laughs> you know, a large chance of of at least one typo per survey, and of course, this is a serious disadvantage to to complicated or proprietary models. And so, yeah, that's, that goes back to the original beginning of the talk. Okay, and you know, it happens a lot in Florida. We can, we have, we found all these people where they have low compass scores, but like large numbers of prior offenses. And so um, this, this can only really be explained by, um, by some data, some issue with the data. And there's a lot, a lot of people like that in the, in the data set where we just couldn't explain why their compass scores were so low. Okay, so um, just to just to get back to interpretable versus explainable, um, I I wanted to just put up this uh, plot from the DARPA Explainable AI BAA, and here this is like, oops, sorry about all that screaming back there. Um, so this is the plot of like learning performance versus explanation effectiveness, but none of these are quantified. Like this is just some plot that like, you know, it's like it's like somebody like Trump wrote it with a Sharpie or something like that. It's just, you know, it's supposed to indicate that learning performance goes goes down as, as explanation effectiveness goes up. And that's not really true. That's not really the way things work. Um, so the figure doesn't, it's not actually meaningful. It, it sort of indicates that you're working with a static data set, but the truth is that if you actually understand what you're doing and you have better explanations, then um, your learning performance actually goes up. So you, because you can understand what you're doing. Um, in fact, the trade-off doesn't happen like this, like I showed you with the compass uh, uh, with, with the compass data. Um, in fact, learning performance is actually relatively flat um, when it comes to, um, you, you can get very high explanation eff effectiveness with very good learning performance. So, And then, of course, this plot wasn't clear whether they were t talking about explaining black boxes or designing inherently interpretable models. Okay, so I wrote a paper that sort of tries to put all of this into perspective. It's called, you know, stop explaining black box models. It used to be called, please stop explaining black box models, but they had me eliminate the please, so it's a little bit more direct <laughs> than it was before. Um, so it's, you know, stop explaining. And um, it goes through all, all the arguments that I just went through, like the fact that typos cause problems with black box models, um, that they still force you to trust the data set. Um, and, they get you into double trouble. You have to rely on two models instead of one, and those models disagree with each other. And the fact that explanations are not really explanations, they're actually just approximations, and they don't use the same variables, and so you could get confused. And I gave an example of the ProPublica scandal. And then finally, of course, if you can produce an interpretable model, why should you explain black boxes? Do you really want to extend the authority of the black box? Um, yeah, so I don't see, I, I personally haven't really found any reason at all why we should be using black boxes, especially for high stakes decisions. All right, thanks a lot.
Thank you, Cynthia. <clears throat> um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat session. We're going to be going into a break and we'll be starting back up at 315 Central, uh, 615 uh, Eastern. Again, thank you very much. Sure. So shall I start answering some of these questions? I think I will try. OK, so the question is, um, OK. So the question's about um, how we solve the optimization problem for the two helps to be scores, the first one. So we actually, uh, the reference is up here on the screen. It's actually um, the two helps to be um, score is up there, right here. And then the algorithm that solved that optimization problem is called risk slim. It's actually a cutting plane method that has elements of branch and bound in it. It's actually a fairly sophisticated optimization method. And of course, I'm happy to talk to you if you want to try it out. OK, cool. Yeah, so I think, I think that's about it. All right, I think that's it. Thank you.